Hey, North Point, glad you're joining us this morning. Looking forward to worshiping together. Right now, I'd love you to grab your cell phone and text 833-CHAT-NCC. And there's three keywords that you could text to get what you need. One would be guest. If you're kind of new with us, uh, text that. It's going to send you some information. You're going to love it. If you don't have the North Point app yet, you could text app to that same number, and they're going to give you the ability to download the app, which is cool. And also, anytime during the service, if you'd like to give, if you text that keyword GIVE to 833-CHAT-NCC. That'll take you to the right place to do that. Only other thing I want to tell you is that we will be doing communion a little bit later in the service. This could be a great time to pause, grab some elements for that, come right back, and then we'll join together in worship. Have a great morning. Good morning. Good morning. How many of you would rather be here than in a hospital today? Good. Just check in. Um, so, so glad you're here. Um, two weeks ago, our son Joe arrived from Missouri, and after church two Sundays ago, we left for a vacation up north. We left on Sunday afternoon, headed up to Crystal Lake near Carson City, and saw our family cottage there. Um, Buried in snow, our uninsulated family cottage. It was great. From, from there, we, yeah, there we go. From there, we headed up and we went skiing on Monday and Tuesday at Caberfe and Crystal Mountain. It was marvelous time, marvelous time. On Wednesday, we walked on the frozen tundra of the seashore of Lake Michigan near Sleeping Bear Dunes. And, uh, and then uh, did some traveling. On Thursday, we had traveled up into the UP, and we went to the ice caves at Eben or Eben, wherever that, Eben, Eben. Amy says Eben Ice Caves, um, which was great fun. And then uh, in the afternoon, we were able to go to Taquaman and Falls and see the falls frozen uh, for the most part. Really, really fun. We uh, then on Friday skied Boyne, Boyne Mountain, uh, which was great, and Saturday headed home with a final stop at Cops and Donuts in Clare. It was wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Um, we had a little more physical activity than I typically experience in the office in a regular week. On Friday afternoon, as we're skiing Boyne, um, we'd, we'd done all that stuff all week. We had hiked a whole bunch on Thursday. And on Friday afternoon, we're at the top of the mountain, starting to ski down, and a conversation happened within my body. Um, I was going a little bit too fast, and my brain said to my legs, uh, turn and slow down. And my legs kind of looked up at my brain and said, mm, nah, I don't think so. Um, I'm kind of tired. And my brain said, um, legs, you need to move because you see that top of that slope over there, it has a black diamond on it. Um, if you're a skier, you know that's an expert slope. Um, and my legs kind of said, if you keep going, you're going to die. You know, it's going to be one spectacular crash, you're going to go over the edge. It's going to be the last thing you ever do again. And, um, and uh, my legs said, well... Okay, we'll slow down some. But it was, it was in that moment that I really realized our muscles matter, right? They have to be prepared. They have to do what they're called to do. Um, when they don't work, the body suffers. And it, had I gone over the top of that hill, the body would have really, really suffered. It would have been a bad thing. Um, we've spent the last seven weeks reading through the New Testament. It's uh, been a really cool thing. Getting to know Jesus and to, and to see what, um, what it looks like to be changed by him. Um, we're over halfway through the New Testament, if you've been reading along. If you haven't, let me just encourage you. Um, today we're, we're going to finish with 1 Corinthians. Um, the easiest thing that you can do is just start today and jump into 2 Corinthians or start tomorrow morning, 2 Corinthians, and just read three chapters a day. And next week, the message will have all kinds of meaning because uh, all of a sudden you'll have the context for that in a way that you ha haven't had it before. Um, we're in the section of the New Testaments. We, uh, Jake talked about, the, uh, about this last week. Um, 
we, the first four books are all about the life of Jesus. The book of Acts, the fifth book, is all about the history of the church. We're now in a section called the letters or the epistles. Um, the epistles is not a word that we use very often. Basically, it's a $5 word that means letters. All right, They're letters that were written to individuals or to churches to give instruction and to, and to help describe for people, to help deal with issues, but to help people understand what it looks like to live a life fully devoted to Jesus, to be changed by him. Today, the message is really just a, a one-thought message. It's, it's a one concept that I want to share a little bit later from 1 Corinthians, but I want to paint kind of the background and, and uh, fill in some stuff about the church in Corinth so that you understand the, the, uh, both the content of, of what I want to say today, um, but also the content of Paul's teaching uh, to the church. Um, the, uh, the, the letters, the first and second um, Corinthians books were letters that were written to a church in Corinth. Corinth is a city in Greece. It's about 50 miles uh, southwest of, of Athens. It's a port city, so it has two separate bays that were there. And in the first century, it was an international, uh, crazy, rich city because of these two ports. That there was all kinds of international trade that happened through there, and the city itself was a growing, thriving city with all kinds of diversity. Because it was international, because of the, the sea travel, um, there were people there from lots of different countries, lots of different languages, lots of different races. Um, it was a city that didn't know a lot about boundaries, all right? It was wealthy. People did kind of whatever they want. Sexually, th everything was just kind of out there for whatever you wanted. It was kind of there. Um, if you can picture a combination of Las Vegas and Los Angeles blended together, um, there was an arrogance that was there as well. Uh, that was the city of Corinth. Paul goes and plants a church in Corinth. If you want to read about that, um, I, th I think I have this in the, in the app notes. In Acts 18, you can read about Paul going and planting a church there on his second missionary journey. Pretty cool thing. So he starts this church there, and Paul invests 18 months, roughly, in this new church that he's planted. So he's helping them understand what it looks like to follow Jesus. These people who are from a very different kind of background. And the church was diverse as well. It had Jews, Greeks, slaves, free. It had all kinds of different people from all kinds of different places that were there following Jesus together. Um, the church was planted about 50 AD. Paul spends about 18 months there. Um, it, later, when he's in Ephesus, uh, they send a letter to him to ask questions about what it looks like. They've got some issues that they're trying to figure out about what it means to follow Jesus. And he writes back. Uh, we think that the date of this letter is about 55 AD. So it's uh, somewhere between 20, uh, 25 years, uh, 20, maybe 30 years after Jesus' resurrection uh, in that general time frame. Um, historians tell us that the church that Paul wrote to was a church um, uh, so of somewhere between 40 and 150. Uh, that's, that's a pretty big span, but the, it's, it's hard to know. But if you look at, at what we have right here in this service right now, that's about the size of the church in Corinth. Paul had invested in them, so they knew each other. They had worshiped together uh, probably for th three to five years, somewhere in there. They were invested into each other's lives, and Paul loved them deeply. And it was a church that was full of lots of problems. And so Paul's letter to them deals with those problems, and it deals with them very directly. Paul wrote to correct those problems, to readjust their thinking, to help them conform to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What were some of the problems? There were divisions in the church. There were people in the church that said, oh, I was baptized by Paul. Oh, I was baptized by, by Aquila. Oh, I was baptized by Peter, whatever. There were people that liked one speaker better than another. If you can imagine if, if, um, if people at North Point said, oh, Rick's preaching, I'm out of here. Uh, I just want to listen to Jake or I just want to listen to Chris. That was, that, was the, that was the scenario that was there in the church. Lots of division. And Paul said... But Paul tackled that head on, and it, he said, that is not what it means to be the body of Christ. That has to stop. There were issues of sexual immorality within the church. 
There was a guy, again, uh, look at the people around you. Think about this size. There was a guy who was sleeping with his stepmom. There were people in the church, followers of Jesus, who were sleeping with temple prostitutes. And there were people in the church who knew about that and said, oh, this is really good because God's grace gets shown even more. Paul says, that's crazy. That has to stop. That's not what it is to follow Jesus. There were Christians who were mad at each other and were going to court. They were, they were in dispute with each other. And Paul said, that's got to stop. That sends the, in, it sends an entirely bad message to the world when you can't work out your problems and you're taking them to a secular court to work it, to work it out. There were issues about eating meat. Um, the, there were the meat that was, that was um, given, sacrificed to idols. And, and some people who were new Christians who had come out of that idol worship said, yeah, you can't do that. And other people said, it's just meat. It's not that big a deal. And, and Paul's instruction to them was to say, man, you've got to, you've got to think about the weaker brother among you. You've got, to, you've got to curb your action. You've got to be willing to do that for the sake of people who are weaker. And you who are weaker realize that this is not a sin issue. It's a conscience issue. Um, and, and you need to grow in that. There were people who said that they had the right to do certain things, and because they had those rights and were exercising them, it was causing division and problems in the church. Paul said, just because you have the right to do something doesn't mean that you should exercise that right. Think instead about how your actions are going to impact others. When they gathered to worship, there was, there, there was just a chaos. There, was, um, there were problems when they came to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, people were not paying attention to anybody else. They were actually having a big meal, and people would be done with the meal before anybody else got started. Um, people were getting drunk during, during communion. It was a mess. There were issues with, uh, in worship with the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. Somebody would speak in a language empowered by the Holy Spirit that they had never learned before. And they, and they would fight for time to see who was going to be up front and, and who got to be the, God's spokesman. Paul tackles that head on and says, you know what, that's not what it means to be the body of Christ. It has to stop. They didn't understand the significance of the resurrection. And Paul wrote to them. And in chapter 15, in an incredible passage of, uh, of Scripture, writes about the power of the resurrection. Man, be sure and read that. This church was a messed up church. And in this letter, Paul doesn't beat around the bush at all because he cares for them so deeply. He had invested his life in these people. And so he very directly, very much out of love and concern says, this is what you've got to do. You've got to change your actions. To continue to let them stay on the path that they were would be destructive to the body of Christ, destructive to those, those disciples, and it would keep them from growing in Jesus. So Paul said, this is what has to happen. What you're doing right now does not honor Jesus. I want to take a look at one of those issues that Paul mentions in, in uh, his letter to the church in Corinth that I think is incredibly relevant to us here at North Point in 2021, right here and now. Um, let, me, let me just transition in this way. When, when we come to know Jesus, when we really come to know him, not just that we accept a kind of Christian moral worldview, but we really know him. What happens is that we change. Our perspective on life changes. The way that we see other people changes. The way that we process information changes. The way that we treat others changes. How we see our marriage, how we see our parenting, how we see our finances. That all changes when we really meet Jesus. And how we view the church changes as well. There are a whole lot of people in our culture, probably even here, that, that view the church as this, this group of people that have kind of similar values, similar problems, that get together and they encourage each other and, that, and that's great. But it's really just another organization. It's a place where people are committed to but exists primarily just for them, for their family, friends, for anybody that they can sucker into coming to church to, right? Um, and, and that they may try it and like it, and if they do, that's great. If they don't really like it, then they'll go back to sleeping in on Sunday mornings. 
right? Um, that it's the kind of thing that as long as they're getting what they want, that's great. But if there's a better preacher someplace else, better music someplace else, better whatever, someplace, I'll go there instead. Paul says to the church in Corinth in chapters 12 through 14, that's not what it's about at all. The church is a body with a mission and a purpose. And there's no such thing as a member who's not committed to the mission of the church. You can't have one foot in and one foot out. You can't just go through the motions. You're either connected and serving and building up the body of Christ, or you're not. I'm going to read uh, down through a portion of, of chapters 12 and 14. I want you to follow along on screen or on the app. So this is kind of an edited version of Paul's, um, of Paul's thinking, Paul's, um, the, what he's trying to communicate to these people that he loves so dearly. I'm starting in verse 4 of, of, second, of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Verse 12, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many parts, not just one part. Verse 18, our bodies also have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange your body would be if it only had one part. Yeah, there are many parts, there's only one part. Body, verse 22. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts don't require that special, that special care. So God has put together, God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all of the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is part of it. Then he goes into chapter 13, which is the love chapter that you hear about in weddings, right? Um, but he's describing what holds the body together, that love that's there. Chapter 14, he goes on, verse 4. A person who speaks in tongues, who speaks supernaturally in a different language that they haven't learned by the power of the Holy Spirit, is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy, somebody who speaks in a language that everybody understands, strengthens the entire church. Verse 26. Well, my brothers and sisters, let me summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, another will interpret what's said, but everything that is done, everything that is done must strengthen all of you. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that God has made you and that he made you for a purpose, hear this, you have been given gifts to serve the body of Christ. There is no excuse, no good reason to not use your gifts to build up the body of Christ. If you've been given those gifts, by God, he's given, to you, he's given them to you for a purpose and those gifts are to be used. When they're not used, the body suffers. Hear me in this. We are less of a body right now here at North Point. We are less of a body than we could be because so many people are not using 
their gifts. There, there are people who say, ah, you know, I don't need to go to a church building on Sunday morning in order to worship. And, and they're right in that. You don't have to come here in order to worship. But when you don't gather together with the body, when you don't use the gifts that God has given you to build up the body, the body of Christ suffers. It's not enough. It's not enough to come and gather with the church and sit on the sidelines. It's not enough to stay home and say, I'm a part of the body of Christ, but not be doing anything that builds up the body of Christ. The church can't be consumed like a concert or a podcast. The question for all of us today, whether you're watching at home or, uh, or whether you're here in purpose is, the, the question is, what are your gifts and how can you use them to build up the body of Christ? Um, we've, we've been dealing with COVID for almost a year now. It's been 11 months. Can you believe it? Um, it's, it's, it was one thing, I think, initially to simply try and survive the way when we didn't know so much about, about the virus. It's a completely different thing now, 11 months later, to detach from serving the body of Christ because of your circumstances, because of COVID, no matter where you are. Think, think with me for a second. Are Christians in Syria or China or North Korea or the Middle East isolating themselves because of the persecution that they're experiencing? No, they're finding ways to build up the body of Christ even in the midst of that persecution. Did Paul stop serving the body of Christ when he was arrested? No, whoa, <laughs> no. He was in jail, right? When he was arrested, he was in jail, so he couldn't go into the synagogues or teach in the city square. Instead, he built up the body of Christ where he was, whether that was from the, the center of a jail cell, whether that was on a transport ship as he was being shipped to Rome, whether uh, he was in house imprisonment, um, it didn't matter. He entertained guests. He wrote letters. He, uh, he talked to the people who were guarding him to build the body of Christ regardless of his circumstances. There's a hard question, I think, that comes out of this passage in this concept. How can you build up the body of Christ? How can you build up the body of Christ? If you're a mom with a newborn or a house full of little guys, how can you build up the body of Christ? Because that's what you're called to do. If you're in close contact with aging parents, and so you're staying isolated to protect them from, uh, from potential exposure to COVID, how can you build up the body of Christ? Because that's what you're called to do. If you have leadership gifts or serving gifts or hospitality gifts or gifts of encouraging and you feel like you need to limit your contact with people because of COVID, how do you build up the body of Christ? Because that's what you're called to do. If you're a snowboard, how do you, how do you build up the body of Christ? If you're working from home, how can you build up the body of Christ? If you're a computer programmer or work in a restaurant or a first responder or a medical professional or a writer or a university employee or a teacher or a worker in the auto industry or a retiree, how can you build up the body of Christ? Because that's what you're called to do as a follower of Jesus. It would be really easy to reduce this message to an ask for people to work in children's ministry or student ministry or be a part of the prayer team or, uh, or, or to host or to lead a, a life group. All of those things may be a part of building up the body of Christ. But I think Paul was describing something much deeper than that, than serving one hour a week. You know, there had to be people in the church in Corinth who thought, yeah, I know Jesus, I love Jesus, I'm following him, but I got nothing to share with the body. 
I'm not like, I, I don't have financial resources like that guy Barnabas in Jerusalem that sold the land and gave all that money to the church. I, I don't have that. I don't have, uh, you know, I, I don't have skills like uh, that lady that sews for, for people. To, what was her name? Dorcas. I, I don't have a big house like Lydia in, in Philippi where I can entertain people and have people stay with me. I can't speak like Peter or Paul. I, you know, I don't, I'm not young. I don't have, I can't do an apprenticeship. I'm not like Timothy. All they could see, all they could see was what they couldn't do. Paul addressed that and said, you can't say because I'm not an eye or a mouth that I'm not a part of the body. You're a part of the body. God has equipped you to build up the body of Christ. There were, there were people probably on the other side too that said, you know what, I don't need anybody else to follow Jesus. I can do it all on my own. You give me a problem, I'll solve it. You know, that problem in Jerusalem with those widows that weren't being fed, it took seven guys in Jerusalem. If they would have just asked me, I could have taken care of it. I could have, I could have solved the whole problem. There were people that said, oh, because you're not like me, because you're not a hand or a foot, you, because you're not like me, you're not really a part of the body. Paul says, that's not it at all. You've all been given gifts to serve the body. If you aren't using your gifts to build up the body of Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're coming to church in person or whether you're at home watching we are less than we could be. We suffer as a body because you're not using the gifts that God has given you. People often ask, um, what's it mean to be a member at North Point? Should I, should I take a step and become a member at North Point? A member means that you're committed to the body of Christ here in this place. Committed to building up the body of Christ, committed to serving the body here, committing, committed to talking about how Jesus is working in your life and what you're learning. It means that you're given financially to help take care of the needs of others and to help the gospel go into places that we can't physically go, to Papua New Guinea, to Sri Lanka, to Ukraine, to rural teens in southern Michigan. It means that you're, to be a member means that you're committed to disciple-making relationships in your world, right here where you are, that, that may be a, a life group here at North Point. It means, to be a member means that you're committed to praying for the leadership of the church and following as they lead. It means that you're finding a way to use the gifts that God has given you to build up the body of Christ. And you're not waiting on someone to ask you to use those gifts because you care for the body like Paul cared for the body. You're finding a way. You're looking for a way that you can build up the body of Christ. Why? Because of your love for Jesus. Because of your love for the bride, the body of Christ. You're committed to her. Do you know what the opposite of the word member is? It's the word dismember. If you're a follower of Jesus but are standing on the sidelines, not willing to build up the body of Christ. Christ's body is dismembered. There's a finger on the side of the road, an arm someplace else, a foot, an eye, a mouth, a hand, disconnected to the body. There are times in a human body when, when one part of the body goes rogue. That was my conversation on the ski slope Friday a week ago. Brain said, move, Body said no. There, there, there are even more specific times in your body when, a, when one part goes rogue and starts living for itself. It doesn't care at all about the rest of the body. It only feeds and cares for itself. It acts independently. You know what that's called? Cancer. There are other times when the body stops functioning or a part of the body stops functioning the way that it was designed. When that happens in your brain, it's called dementia or Alzheimer's. When it happens in one of your limbs, we talk about people being disabled. Muscles matter to the body. When muscles aren't used, they atrophy. They shrivel up and die. 
and it can take months or years for them to recover. Have you ever seen somebody who had an arm or a leg broken and, and where's the cast for the six weeks? And then when they get the cast cut off, they compare their arms or their legs and one is this spindly little thing. The bone's good, but the muscles haven't been used for six or eight weeks. And it does, that limb doesn't even look like it's a part of the body. It hasn't been used for so long. Here's the heart of today's message. You can't be serious about following Jesus and not be serious about building up the body. Muscles matter. If you are here in person, find a way to build up the body of Christ. If you're watching from home, find a way to build up the body of Christ. Don't let Satan fool you into thinking that you're fine spiritually when you're only focused on taking care of yourself and not building up the body. Let's pray. Um, God, we want to be the body that you've called us to be. And Lord, so many of us just aren't sure what that looks like. We, we, we don't know what to do. God, would you reveal to us what gifts you've given us and how we can build up the body here at North Point, how we can build up your church universal. God, how we can be a part of the kingdom and just help it move, move forward for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, I wanna take a look at one other passage of scripture from, the, from what we've been reading this week as we head into communion where Paul dealt directly with the problem that was going on in the church uh, in Corinth. I mentioned that, that communion was just kind of chaotic. Um, people were doing their own thing. Hear, hear what happens as I read from 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says to these people that he loves dearly, when you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have homes, your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? I will certainly not praise you for this. For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. He gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread, drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That's why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you're really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment on yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about the other matters after I arrive. Paul says... You've got to care about the body of Christ. You've got to honor others, even in something as personal as celebrating communion. Hear me in this. The Lord's Supper is a really big deal. We're remembering that Jesus died in our place, that he took our punishment for all of the sinful and hurtful things that we've done knowing that sin had to be dealt with, it, that it had to be paid for with blood, Jesus willingly said, I'll go. 
I'll take, I'll take that punishment that they deserve on myself. I will sacrifice so you can survive. Think about that. I don't know if you know it or not, but in 2019, five million people played organized football in the United States. Five million people in 2019. In the last hundred years, 27,000 men have played in the National Football League. Five million a year, 27,000 in a hundred years have played in the NFL. Less than a thousand have played in the Super Bowl. Most of those other 26,000 would, would do anything to have been able to have played in the Super Bowl, to be able to have held the Super Bowl trophy as a champion. Tom Brady's played in 10 Super Bowls. He's won seven. The Super Bowl has become so routine for Tom Brady that two weeks ago he'd had too much to drink and he threw the Super Bowl trophy from a moving boat to teammates on another moving boat. Winning the Super Bowl has become so common, so ordinary, that he has lost the concept of how valuable that trophy is. How do you view the Lord's Supper? As someone so aware of your sinfulness and God's beautiful grace that you tremble at the thought of Jesus' death in your place. Or someone so cavalier about both your sin and the price that Jesus paid that you simply go through the motions when we share in communion. Paul says, examine yourself seriously. We're going to spend the next few moments individually and collectively thinking about what it meant for Jesus to go to the cross. Thinking about our sinfulness. Maybe, maybe today you need to come to Jesus' moment to ask for forgiveness, to repent. Maybe you need to fall on your knees and worship him in a way that you never have before. Whatever you need to do, do it. And when you're ready, take that little wafer from the top of, of what you have there and eat it, knowing that it's a reminder of Jesus' body that was bloodied and broken because of his love for you. Then when you're ready, drink the juice, that little bit of juice, as a reminder of the incredible volume of blood that Jesus lost from his head, from his hands, from his side, from his feet because of his love for you. And in a few minutes, we'll sing a song of worship and praise together. That's gratitude for that love. Let's share in our time of communion.
Lord, together we confess to you that we are not worthy. God, that we're that we're filled with sin in the deep res- recesses of our life. That there's not good in us. And that only because of Jesus can we stand in your presence. God, only because of his sacrifice, only because of his willingness to take our sin on himself, does any of this make any sense? God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your love for letting Jesus go to the cross for us so that we could experience forgiveness and new life. We thank you, Father, for these reminders that we can touch and feel and taste of his body and his blood. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
We'll see you next Sunday.